Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, goody. We got people coming up the stairs even. Yay. <laughs> we ready? Okay. that had gotten postponed and then postponed and postponed for, for COVID. And so um, instead of trying to do the whole trip to Portland back in one day, we got to stay the night and it was good, um, but I missed you guys. So welcome, uh, got a couple things going on this week. Um, Wednesday night, kids ministry has merged with the Crossroad Crafted Kids program. So it's meeting at seven o'clock at Crossroad Church and um, they've had two weeks there already. The kids have had so much fun. They've got videos and worship and games and it's wild and crazy and my brain is blown. Um, but 
that already just we've had some really good discussions with the kids in our small group time, and so it's been so good to join forces with them. Um, several of our volunteers have gone over there and helped, but we can always use more because <laughs> it is a little bit wild and crazy uh, and a little bit of a limited space. So um, if that's something that you would like to help with, the great thing is the more hands we have, the less work you have to do. So there are some roles like offering person. That's what I got to do last week. So it's not like you have to be super awesome teacher. You get to take the bucket around to the children, and then you get to pray for the offering. Or um, some people are just responsible for helping them remember the memory verse, or they're small group leaders. Um, but then also, they don't currently have a snack time, though I talked to their children's pastor, and she was like, hey, if your people like to cook, they like to do snacks. Like, we could do that. We just haven't had the people who have that passion um, or administrative things. So come and talk to me or Pastor Tim if there's a way that you'd like to help out with, um, with Wednesday nights. And then on Thursdays, our prayer time has been moved to 6 o'clock. So you get an extra half hour to eat your dinner, come at 6 o'clock, and then stay for 7 o'clock. Revelation Bible study. Norm is back! Woo-hoo! We are so excited. Welcome back, Norm. Um, and that's really great. And then also, mark your calendars. Next week, potluck after church. There's a sign-up out in the lobby. And then it's also part of our church family meeting. We're going to be going over the budget so that you can know kind of what's going on. Pastor Tim is going to be giving you the state of the address, so to speak. Um, so make sure that you are here. If you don't feel comfortable to participate in the eating portion, at least consider coming and being a part of the meeting portion. And you can sit somewhere else and keep your mask on. And that's okay. And we still love you. Um, just whatever, whatever works for you. So... I think those are all of our announcements for today. I'm just going to uh, open us in prayer. So go ahead and stand up with us again as we go back into singing through worship singing. God, we give you all we've got this morning. We come to you with open and honest hearts, just wanting to meet with you, wanting to glorify you, wanting our hearts and our lives to be a living sacrifice to you. God, there may be some things that we're struggling with today in our hearts, or we don't really even know that we're struggling with it, but Holy Spirit, would you illuminate the parts of us that you want to heal this morning, the parts that you want to bring to light and that you want to transform, and God, help us to just be open to whatever you have to say, however it is that you want to move in our lives and in our hearts and in our families and our neighborhood today. We're just so grateful that we get to come and meet with you as a family today. Amen.
imagine. What you have done for us astounds us and it humbles us. 
and we are beyond grateful to be called your children. Amen. You may have a seat, and kiddos, we get to go downstairs for kids' church. Well, good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm doing good. Thanks, Norm. Hey, it's so good to see your smiling face. Man, what? That's right. Thank you, Jody. That's absolutely right. All right. Well, uh, before we get started here in our study, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer, and uh, then we'll dig in to the word this morning. Uh, Father God, we thank you for all that you have done in our lives, even down to the breath in our lungs. And that electric charge that is going through our body that helps our, our heart pump, you know, our heart beat. God, you have made us wonderfully, and we praise you for that. We thank you so much for the good weather this week. Um, for me, <laughs> being so new to town, this is unusual for me. This is usually when we hunker down, <laughs> and it's a snowstorm. And so uh, thank you, God, that I'm no longer in the valley, but I am uh, on the mountaintop. I'm near the beach. I'm here. And God, I praise you for that. Lord, right now, I just want to lift our community to you. God, we have a lot going on. We have a lot of people getting sick. We have a lot of uh, people who are, uh, are, are removing themselves from community uh, in order to uh, quarantine so they don't get sick. And uh, there's a lot of fear that's being stirred up in our community and in our world today. And Father, we know that you are the Prince of Peace. God, we know that you are still on the throne. Jesus, you are the King of Kings, and you are in control of all. And so, God, we put our trust in you, not in ourselves. Um, God, we, we know that you see all of this. You see, uh, you saw it way back in the beginning, and you will see the end. Uh, God, you are the beginning and the end. And so, God, we praise you for that. We praise you for uh, all that you've shown yourself to be. Lord, how fitting that first song is, you know, uh, come and behold all that he is. God, we got to see all that you are this morning, even just singing songs. And so this morning, as we open up the pages of Scripture, God, would you come and meet with us? God, would you come and speak to us? Um, Lord, would you speak through me? Um, I'm, I'm just a vessel, I'm just a servant, and these are your people waiting to hear from you. And so, God, help me to get out of the way and let your word shine forth and tell us what you want to say, even if it's hard for us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone. The title for today's message is called Gorilla Love not the kind of love between two gorillas, but we'll talk about that in a second. But the title is going to be Gorilla Love, if you're taking notes. Um, the passage we're going to be looking at today is Matthew 5, 38 through 42. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together is that only God's radical love can bring us resolution. Only God's radical love can bring us resolution. We have been going through a series, taking a look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We've been at it for a while. 
Uh, we're not out of the woods yet by any means. Uh, this is his most famous teaching, and Jesus gives us uh, kind of a third of the way through these six case study examples of how the kingdom of God actually calls us up into a higher understanding of who God is, what God is like, and what his law really means for our life beyond just our understanding of the letter of the law. And so this week, we are in case five of six, hallelujah, and we're looking at what the Old Testament has to say about the issue of retaliation. There has been and probably always will be a certain way of looking at settling a dispute to get even with an opposing party. But I would submit to you today that Jesus is not only calling us to a higher standard and worldview, but he's actually calling us up into something so different and so irregular that we might describe it by a certain kind of word. And I've chosen the word for us. You, if you have a problem with it, talk to me later. But uh, the word gorilla, uh, it's usually used uh, to refer to or modify just uh, an idea about a way of fighting or combat or war, but, uh, and sometimes it gets applied to all manner of other things. Um, like I was looking up in the dictionary and there's also guerrilla theater. Who knew? Uh, and, uh, you know, where it's an irregular form of the arts and that kind of thing. But what if we took that same kind of principle, that irregular, unusual principle, and applied it to the action that I believe that Jesus is really calling us to practice. Because I would submit to you today that the kingdom principle that Jesus is calling us to practice is actually something best described as guerrilla love. Something so new, something so unexpected and irregular that it might just transform the landscape of our lives, our relationships, and even our communities around us. Because only God's radical love can bring us resolution. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Uh, Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Jesus speaking to his disciples said, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. In verses 38 and 39, Jesus continues with the pattern we've gotten accustomed to. It's going to be glorious when we get out of this pattern because it's going to be like a whole new world. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he, he gives us this pattern where he gives us an example. He cites something from the Old Testament law and then he places his interpretation on the same level with what God had already said. So the quotation here comes from Exodus chapter 21, uh, Exodus 21, 23 through 25, where the law says, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And again, God also repeats this in Deuteronomy 19.21, where he says, Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And this law of retribution is among the most 
ancient law that we have in all of recorded human history. Even before it was recorded in the Hebrew scriptures, it was written down uh, on a clay tablet in cuneiform uh, called the Code of Hammurabi. He was the sixth king of the first dynasty of ancient Babylon. And so with that in mind, we might be tempted to think, oh, well, the Bible just co-opted this idea. I don't want to go there because I think that it's not that the Bible somehow appropriated or stole this law uh, in some way. I do think, though, that this even for even, this eye for eye, tooth for tooth idea is a law that everybody, everywhere, for all of time has experienced and upheld. Uh, even in our court systems, uh, there are certain limits put on laws so that, or, or, or consequences that you get for having done a certain crime. It used to be that if you killed somebody, watch out, you're going to be on, the, uh, have the death penalty, right? You know, uh, a thing for thing, that sort of deal. Now, in the book Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes that these then are the two points. He, he illustrates this law this way. He says, here are the two points. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Everybody everywhere has laws, folks. All right. Now, secondly, he says that they do not, in fact, behave in that way. Oops. <laughs> they know that the law of nature, but they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. I have a good friend who is really good at fighting. I mean, he bona fide, he used to do it semi-pro in his younger days. And one time we were talking, uh, probably because my son Ruben just has this ten tendency to just like let his arms fly in a certain direction, but he he gave me this perspective about fighting. He said, you know, on the streets, uh, we used to have the saying, don't write a check you can't cash. <laughs> don't write a check you can't cash. In other words, you know, if you can't follow through on a fight till the end, don't start one. Uh, one possible application for this eye for eye principle is that if you want to keep both of your eyes do your very best to make sure you don't take out anybody else's eyes. Uh, there's this famous quote by Mahatma Gandhi that says, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Uh, and that's because we all have this tendency to fight one another. We all kind of take up arms and we take up sides and that tends to be uh, an experience that we have. Now, in citing all of this, in, in calling all these references up, Jesus in Matthew 5, upholds that this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth principle is found in the scriptures. He's not doing away with it. It's a principle that ensures that a right measure of justice is had, that it's something that won't disappear. It's something that it was verbally spoken by God and physically written down by his servant Moses. And Jesus upholds this truth. He is calling us, though, to, while he does that, consider a deeper principle in God's kingdom. Because even though we may have the legal right for retribution, we should also consider whether or not it is truly best for us to exercise our rights in that place of being wronged. So what does Jesus mean when he says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, in its original language that this was written in, in Greek, uh, the word resist means to take legal action against. Um, the word for evil that's used here, it describes a state or condition that when that is applied to an object, it puts things in a bad way. It makes things hard or difficult uh, this word for evil would have been associated with conditions like being blind or diseased or, or crippled in some way. Um, 
In this way, evil can be seen as a trial or an obstacle that makes life more difficult. Kind of like, I know we don't get this so much here in town, but if somebody cuts you off and like almost hits you, that is a trial. Uh, you might say, what an evil person. <laughs> that evil action that that person did. Ah, you know, uh, if your neighbor uh, tries to uh, put a tree in your yard that you don't want in your yard because it's going to be a tripping hazard, you might call that action evil, right? It's an obstacle, it's a trial, it's something that might get in the way. Uh, if, you know, a, a couple weeks back I had this just excruciating tooth pain, what an evil pain in my head. <laughs> it was an obstacle to say the least and uh, thankfully I, I'm, I'm getting treated, I, ha I have a dentist here in town, uh, I'm in a good place. But that is the kind of difficulty that we see here. Now, how many of you have experienced someone uh, or something that was just flat out difficult, right? Or someone who just made your life difficult. Maybe they didn't even mean to, but it just sort of happened by the things that they did. I think we all could agree we've experienced that on one level or another. So put all together to not resist an evil person, as Jesus said, means to not take legal action against them uh, because, uh, whose personality or actions have caused you some kind of hardship or pain. Jesus' solution for how to respond to being wronged is to not exercise our rights for retribution. That's the idea of the kind of unprecedented guerrilla love that our experience of God's kingdom leads us to live out. And so here, Jesus gives us four examples. They're not limited to these four, but he gives us four kind of primary examples of what it looks like to practice this kind of love, because only God's radical love can bring us resolution. So the first is that when we are offended, practice kindness instead of retaliation. Practice kindness instead of retaliation. Picking up in the second half of verse 39, Jesus gives us that first example, right? Uh, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. He's talking about one of the most offensive insults that one person could do to another in Jewish culture. And that was during a personal dispute, if things got particularly heat heated and it was going to come to blows, the most offensive hit you could do was to backhand someone with your right hand across their right cheek. This was beyond a foul. This is not good. You know, picture your favorite fist fight scene in a movie. Maybe you don't like those kinds of movies or you don't watch movies. That's okay. But I'm sure you've been in a fight or you've seen one because we're in this world. And so isn't there this moment, though, when somebody does something particularly low and in that place of offense, uh, the person who's offended shoots the, uh, the offender this dirty look, right, that you could possibly, the, just the dirtiest look you could imagine, and then that usually ramps everything up to an even bigger throwdown than before. But what happens to actually end the fight? When does the fight usually end? It could be when both parties are all sapped of all strength and energy, and they just both decide to leave. That doesn't really bring them back together, but they just decide, hey, we're going to leave. In the movies, it might be when the police show up <laughs> uh, and everybody just scatters because they don't want to be associated with this situation. In our day-to-day -day lives, maybe it's not fist to cuffs, but when does our fighting end? The physical fighting might end any number of ways. But usually there comes a point where we are faced with a choice. We can either 
continue to hold a grudge and plot a way to get back at that other person who did us wrong. Or we can choose a different way that may not feed our egos so well, but maybe it's the best course of action at bringing peace between two opposing parties. And that is to choose to love, even when it's difficult. The truth is, we can only take ourselves so far in that pursuit of kindness instead of retribution. We actually need a strength that's beyond our own to get us to the place of actually letting love and kindness drive our actions. That's a strength that can only come from one place, from our Creator God, who loved us with an unfailing, revolutionary, never-stopping kind of love to bring us back together with himself. With himself. Now, Romans 5, verses 6 through 11 says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's Romans 5, 6 through 11. Also in Proverbs 17, verse 9, it says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. As a people who have been reconciled and forgiven, brought back together with God because of his example of love, we have received firsthand the kind of resolution that is possible when the person who has been offended chooses the way of love. So when we are offended, Jesus calls us to practice kindness instead of retaliation. Because the truth is only God's radical love can bring us resolution. Any other response just creates more and more division. Next, from Matthew 5, we find in verse 40 that when we are exploited, practice people over possessions. When we're exploited, practice people over possessions. So in verse 40, Jesus said, If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. What is going on here? I don't have a tunic. I don't have a cloak. Well, I have a coat, but that's slightly different. But so what's going on here? To answer that question, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 22, verses 26 through 27. Exodus 22, verses 26 through 27. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. That's the Lord speaking to his people there. And so, if someone owed a debt in Jewish culture, they could put up their cloak, their outward covering as collateral. But even in that practice, the outer garment of a cloak needed to be returned by nightfall because it was a multi purpose use item that everyone used, especially as a covering at night to keep warm. 
And so for the majority of people in first century Roman Empire, they could, they probably only owned two pieces of clothing, an inner layer and an outer layer, making these articles of clothing absolutely essential and valuable in life. And so for this kind of legal dispute in Jesus' day, this would have been an open and shut case in light of Exodus 22. Because the bottom line, even if this person owed them a great debt, you couldn't just take a poor person's cloak, and most of the people back then were poor. So what is Jesus getting at here if it's such an open and closed case? To be exploited in this way would have certainly been offensive. It was a scandalous thought. It would have been completely outside of the norms of a good God-fearing Jew. But sometimes, isn't it true? Have you found that maybe in our pursuit of justice or restitution over some kind of certain situation, standards and convention might be the last thing on our minds? Even with eye for eye and tooth for tooth, it might solve the literal physical extent of the law, but could our efforts at getting even actually be causing more harm than good? Could it be actually making the situation worse instead of bringing healing to that scenario? So where does God place the priority? Is it in people or in our stuff? In the world, this side of heaven, we will get into spats and dispute. There is no doubt. It will happen. Life is not fair, and we may find ourselves exploited time and time again. The challenging call of Jesus here is to seek resolution by all means necessary. Even if it means giving up what you hold most dear. And so when Jesus says, if somebody sues you for your tunic, that's the inner layer of clothing. And then he's saying, give them your cloak also. Well, then, guys, by, you know, by subtraction, you'd be left with nothing. You'd have no clothes on. You'd be in the raw, (laughs) so to speak. Um, That's not good, and that's pretty shameful. Uh, And really that keeps more shame on the situation because why should someone sue you for your tunic on the inside? But yet, Jesus calls us to put people over our possessions because only God's radical love can bring us resolution. The third example of this kind of crazy, out-of-this-world love that Jesus is calling us to is that when we are oppressed, practice service instead of rebellion. Uh, when we are oppressed, practice service instead of rebellion. I, I was, as I was doing my sermon prep this week, um, I had the thought uh, of um, this great scene in Monty Python's Life of Brian, um, where uh, this particular guy is trying to rebel against the Roman government. He was a part of this group called the Zealots. And so he decided to uh, do some graffiti on the side of a wall, and a Roman soldier came up and said, you've got it wrong. And so then he helped correct it, oddly enough. And so the comedy behind it was that he had to write it a hundred times all, all over, and that really got him in trouble. Now, this verse, in verse 41, when Jesus says, and if anyone would, oh, no, 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 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. He was hitting a nerve in, in the lives of the people he was talking to. Because even though the Jews were living in the promised land at the time, they were not their own sovereign nation, like in the days of David and Solomon. And So in first century, God's people lived in Roman-occupied Palestine. Now, historically, we can look at the Roman Empire, 
and we see that a lot of good came from the fact that Rome sort of unified the entire known world at that time. And the peace of Rome came at a price that was enforced by the Roman military because they had unparalleled absolute authority over both the region and the people that they oversaw. And so there was this practice where according to Roman law, any Roman soldier could force a person to go up to a maximum of one mile or about a, a thousand paces. And so we see an example of that in scripture with uh, the Roman soldier who forced Simon of Cyrene to help Jesus carry the cross to Jesus' execution. He said, you there, carry this cross, and the guy had to do it. In, in the irreverent movie of Monty Python's Life of Brian, he had to write that a hundred times because the Roman soldier told him, now write it correctly a hundred times or else something really inappropriate that I can't say here. And so anyway, so uh, and that's why I didn't choose to do the clip uh, today. And so all this was happening and this formed, this kind of unrest and this oppression is, is the foundation of why a group called the Zealots even formed in the first place. Because they were fed up with being oppressed by the Romans. They wanted to see the kingdom restored to Israel, but the only solution they saw was to take it back by force and retaliation and rebellion. Now, if you were facing oppression day in and day out. The zealot's way of thinking sounds pretty good. It might even feel empowering to stick it to the Romans by fighting back or just to say we're not going to take it or like in the life of Brian, Romans go home. <laughs> These were different times than we live in today or where we live at right here in America. This was a completely different culture because the Jews didn't have an option. They didn't have free speech. They couldn't just tell a Roman soldier no and want to keep their life. So instead of just walking one mile, Jesus says something scandalous, go another mile. The first mile, they didn't have a choice. The second mile, they did have a choice. And so with this issue of oppression, this is a really hot button issue in today. I, I know that it may not touch us exactly right here in Florence. Maybe it does. We can talk about examples later. But I know for one thing that last year, especially maybe this was two years ago even, that there were a bunch of riots that went on that happened because people were fed up with experiencing things that they felt like were oppression. Things that I've never even dreamed of that in the wake of all of that kind of brought a lot to light. And so the example that I see Jesus calling us to is this idea of service over rebellion. It would be something like, if we were to contrast, how, for example, today is, what, January 30th? Tomorrow's the last day of the month. So isn't January, um, I'm looking at Coach Flum back there, isn't January uh, Black History Month? It's February? I don't know. I'm looking at you, bud. I, I love you, bud. Anyway, so we're on the cusp of some time of life where we're celebrating black history, and I'm very glad for that. Um, the interesting thing is we have two, uh, at one point, two very different examples of leaders in the black community who in the 1960s led some form of defiance against the norms of oppression that they had been experiencing. You had Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. One was 
all for peaceful, nonviolent protest, and the other was for, no, we're going to take it back by force, and uh, we're going to stand up for our rights and that kind of thing. Now, interestingly enough, Malcolm X, he eventually repented of that way of thinking and eventually chose a way of nonviolence, but here we had just these two, just even take the names out of it, you have these two different responses to oppression. And Jesus, I really believe, is calling us to some kind of form of, in that place of oppression, like they would have experienced there, choosing a way that's nonviolent, choosing a way that actually serves people rather than rebels against them. And so wherever you sit on that issue, whatever that might be, uh, that's not my point exactly today. My point is just what does our response look like? Does our response really just reflect the anger inside of us, or does it reflect the love of God? And so, that leads us to the final one, the final example that Jesus gives, that when we are coerced, practice generosity without condition. When we're coerced, practice generosity without condition. So, in verse 42, he says, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. When Jesus gave this fourth example, we sort of see a next steps in where to go from this place of injury and offense. Because not only are we supposed to refrain from retaliation, but we're actually supposed to advance God's good in the world through radical generosity as well. We're not, or sorry, we are meant to lean into living out the love that we've experienced from God by giving it away to others. We are given this radical, amazing love in order to give to anyone who asks. In Proverbs 3, 27 through 28, it says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow and I will give it when you have it with you. Proverbs 3, 27 through 28. And so it's here in, in this summary sort of verse that we get a picture of how God intends to advance his kingdom not only in us, but through us. Because when we choose radical generosity, even in the place where the person doesn't deserve it, we're actually pointing people back to our good God who gave himself to show love to all of us. You know, through faith, we have received God's love and redemption. By grace, through faith, we become a part of God's kingdom. And in his kingdom, it's established in our hearts by faith. There's nothing we have done to earn it or deserve it. And when we take that new reality and we practice that same kind of generosity to others, we actually become a revelation of God's love to other people, giving them opportunity to encounter and experience God through how we love them. The practice of generosity in the kingdom of God points everyone back to the king. The kingdom of God is a generous kingdom. It's a loving kingdom. So if we were to summarize all these points and their application, I found this quote from the Cornerstone Biblical Commentary. It had this to say, um, these four examples should not be taken in a pedantic fashion. That's just as you teach this and this happens, like eye for eye, right? That would limit their intended application. One may never need to physically turn the other cheek, give up one's coat, or go an extra mile. Can I hear it? Hallelujah. But one must be willing to unselfishly suffer personal loss with faith that the Heavenly Father will meet one's need and deal with the injustice in his own time. You know, the Bible says, vengeance belongs to the Lord. He's going to work it all out in the end. 
And so even though you and I may never face the exact description that Jesus gave here that people in his day could relate to, we all have moments in our lives that we could probably relate to these examples. And in each case, I would submit to you today that God's radical love is the only thing that can bring us true resolution, the resolution we so desperately need. And we can only take ourselves so far in trying to pursue that kind of kindness instead of retaliation, that people over possession, service instead of rebellion, and generosity without condition. Because offense, exploit, oppression, and coercion are all realities that we are faced with in small or big ways. And the world expects us to fight back and demand our rightful justice. But they can't argue against an act of radical, dare I say, guerrilla love that lays down our rights for those who don't deserve it. You can't argue against it. It's a, a pure revelation of God's love. And when people are met with that kind of love that Jesus has for them, it's the same reaction. And that's our testimony this morning. That's your testimony. Is that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die in your place. He didn't have to. Lord knows I haven't done anything to deserve my gift of grace from him. And yet he willingly put me before himself. He literally stood in my place on that cross to die in my place, the death that I deserved. All so that I could be brought new life. All so that you could be brought new life. What freedom people would have if we didn't hold all these grudges. If we didn't hold these personal offenses and we let God's love transform us from the inside out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, and even in that place of being sorry, it's like we could be as repentant as we could be. And yet we're only responsible for our choice in that place. When let's say we realize we've offended somebody, then we're responsible for that choice to go and say, you know, I, I really apologize for that. I'm sorry. And then at that point, it's their responsibility whether or not to take it up. And so, as has been the case with all these different examples throughout <clears throat> the last uh, four or five that we've done, that higher view, that higher 
standard that Jesus calls us to is to have that pure expression of his love. So in that place of like saying, I'm sorry, or whatever that might be, <laughs> uh, not doing what we in our flesh we might want to do and like give a backhanded comment at the same time, <laughs> right? Um, uh, the kids were just watching a movie the other day and, uh, you know, somebody, you know, shared this really heartfelt moment and he's like, what, that's it? No insult? <laughs> and then came the insult and it's like, ah, there it is. Thank you. And so it's, it's all interesting. But so with that, I, we're going to close out our time because uh, uh, we're running out of time. But I just want to encourage you with this. I, I know it's kind of, it was a heavy teaching kind of day. Um, but I think the encouragement here is that God's love is, is for you and it's with you. Um, and even when we get it wrong, like let's say we stand up for our rights and we say, but ah, this happened. Ah, you know, and we're really frustrated about it. We can still tell God we're sorry and repent and say, God, would you please help me respond differently next time? And his love is there for you to access. Uh, we have to be willing to access it, <laughs> though, and not just want to, you know, throw that hook right back. <laughs> and so um, let's go ahead and pray, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll close with a, a, a send-off blessing. Uh, Father God, we thank you. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. It's really hard to imagine taking all the sin of all the world for all of time on ourselves and going to a cross. And yet, Jesus, that's what you did. Every time that we have failed, God, you have been right there with your grace because you already paid it all for us. And so, God, I ask that you would help us find your peace in our lives. And, Lord, help us to share that peace with other people. We're not going to do it perfect. But, God, we recognize that greater is you who is in us than he who is in the world. And so, God, we, we humble ourselves before, we, before you and we, we ask for your help because we can't do it on our own strength. Not even sometimes we can in our own will if we've been walking with you for a time and you've been leading us through this. But, God, it's hard to get started. And so, Lord, we need your help. We need your strength. Would you just radically transform our lives with your love? If that's never happened in our walk with you before, God, I just pray that for my church family here, God, that we would be so impacted by your love for us, God, that it would change every single part of us, even the parts that we never thought could change, even the parts that we thought, wow, that, that thought, that grudge, that thing will always be with me. God, you have the power to take it away and to transform us from the inside out. And so, God, we invite you into this next week. We invite you to, to bring things to our attention so that we can work on them. And God, as we go, would you continue to walk with us each and every step and at each and every point that we may fall, God, please help us up again so that we can keep running this race for you, keep walking it out. And as people might bring offense or injury to us, God, may what they see from our lives be love. Pure, radical, crazy love that can't be explained except for you. So, 
we give you this week. In your name, amen. Friends, would you stand as we close and receive this as your benediction? May you go from this place knowing that God loves you. And may you go from this place knowing that he's also called you to share that love with other people. So, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day week.